Okay, it's 1994. What Sonic characters do we have? Sonic. Okay. Tails. Alright. Knuckles. Okay. Popful Male. Alright. Wait, who? Popful Male, an elf mercenary created by Falcom. We're going to repropose her as Sonic's sister. Are you serious right now? Yes. Nihon Falcom Corporation is a Japanese video game developer known for its RPG and RPG adjacent titles. Once upon a time, they might have been most well known for their epic action RPG series, Ease, but these days they are probably most well known for their incredibly popular Trails series. Like seriously, just search for this series on YouTube and you will get exactly 9 jagillion hits. It's a series I really need to get more into myself, but today, I'm gonna bring you back to the past to play the games that kick ass. Popful Mail is an action adventure game that was initially released for the PC-8801 in Japan in 1991, but might be most well known for its working designs tainted Sega CD release. It's a humble action adventure game with old school anime aesthetics. The game is practically forgotten by all save for the insane. But did you know that Sega once wanted this game to be retooled as a spin-off of Sonic the Hedgehog? And how Falcom also planned on this game to become its own multimedia franchise? Today, RPG Fortress goes back in time to discuss a game that's not even an RPG, but hey, it has a cute elf girl with a sword and hit points, so it's tangentially related, I guess. Let's go on a magical fantasy adventure. This is Popful Mail. Popful Mail is an action-adventure game originally released on the NEC PC-8801 in 1991. The game used a host of features from the first couple of Ease games, the battle system of Ease, the magic system of Ease 2, and the side-scrolling view of Ease 3. The game was later ported to a number of systems including the PC-9801, the Sega CD, the PC Engine CD, the SNES, mobile phones, and Windows. I know, right? For this review, I mostly want to focus on the Sega CD version as that is the one I'm most familiar with. Plus, it has an English translation. More on that later. Actually, you know what, more on that now. This is normally where I'd note key developers, but Working Designs has obfuscated this. It's really easy to track down the staff from the other versions of this game, but the Sega CD version mostly notes Working Designs staff. I noticed this when I finished the game this last weekend, when the credits roll at the end and it's just working design staff, English actors, and a nebulous Japan team Sega slash Falcom. Victor Ireland gets his name dropped multiple times, but there's no room for the actual game designers and programmers? Give me a break. Going back to the original staff of the PC-8801 original, we have a few people of note. The game's producer was Masayuki Kato, the founder of Nihon Falcom. This guy is a legend and has produced dozens and dozens of Falcom's games. He's still producing today with Ease 9 and Trails of Cold Steel 4 on his resume. Music, of course, was composed and recorded by Falcom Sound Team JDK. This group of musicians has been writing music for Falcom's games since 1991 and have created some incredible soundtracks. A large number of musicians have joined and left over the years, but Sound Team JDK has been a cohesive unit now for decades. What I like about them is that they're almost like a band. It's not just a single musician writing music, but they're like a rock band. And like a rock band, they've released some great arrange and live albums throughout the years. Our story begins with plucky elf mercenary Popful Male engaged in battle with the criminal Nutscracker and the Gingerbread Grifter Gang. After a Saturday morning cartoon style encounter, Nutscracker manages to escape. Feeling down on her luck as she'll miss out on claiming Cracker's bounty, Mail slings back to Bountyville in hopes of catching a break. While in town, she notices a bounty for the golem commanding wizard Muttonhead, who has a huge 2 million gold reward for bringing him in. 
Reinvigorated with the lust for money, Mail immediately sets out on an adventure, a magical fantasy adventure, to track down the crafty wizard. Her first stop is the Elven Woods where she meets a bomb-loving rascal named Slick. Slick is a recurring comedy relief character who you will either love or hate due to working design's writing choices. After fighting some spiders and briefly visiting the Elven Village, Mail meets a young wizard named Tato. During a little conversation between the two adventurers, Mail is shocked to hear that Tato is actually the apprentice of Muttonhead. After parting ways with Tato, Mail heads to Tree Sun, where she fights a bunch of praying mantis robot things and navigates the ladders and platforms of this giant tree. Mail briefly visits Tree Sun Village before heading to the Golem Tower, where she's bound to find Muttonhead, right? After fighting a bunch of golems, she finally meets the dastardly wizard face to face. The pair swap some insults, and Muttonhead flees, leaving a golem for Mail to fight. Mail promptly defeats the automaton and rescues Tato, who now joins her on her quest. The pair head to the Wind Cave, where they are ambushed by Muttonhead. Before the wizard can attack, a booming voice calls him away. The mangy spellcaster refers to this voice as Kazer and promptly escapes. The duo navigates through the cave and once again encounters Slick. He's still annoying and still a jackass. He managed to detonate a bomb and promptly asks you to help him escape. After rocking around the cave some more, you meet a group of squat dragonish creatures named Gaw. With their help, you save Slick, who runs away because of course he does. Pressing forward, you encounter Nutscracker again and once again thoroughly dispatch him. After trekking around the caves, helping the Gaw, saving Slick, one of the Gaw tells you that he will join your quest if you defeat the dragon Goradis. You track down the vile lizard and defeat him easily. Gaw then joins you as your third and final party member, and the newly formed trio apprehend Muttonhead and drag him off to Bountyville to claim their reward. But oops, Bountyville has been destroyed! Turns out Muttonhead's been working for this Kazer, who has in turn been working for an ancient evil called the Overlord. Legend tells that a trio of an elf, human, and dwarf defeated the Overlord and his minions, and how if the Overlord returns again, another trio would defeat them again. And that's where our heroes come in. The story continues from here with our group gaining more knowledge of this ancient evil and setting out to save the day. There's laughs to be laughed, monsters to be vanquished, and adventures to be adventured. While the story of Popful Mail isn't hugely original, it's a fun, like I said before, Saturday morning cartoon style adventure. Nothing too deep, nothing too scary, just fun characters on a fun quest. Popful Mail's gameplay is very familiar. It's sometimes erroneously referred to as an action RPG, hell, even I have done this, but there's no leveling up system and stats are only affected by your equipment. Some people also sometimes refer to the game as a Metroidvania, but this also isn't quite correct. You don't gain abilities that allow you to progress past obstacles, but there is some backtracking and you'll find a couple of keys that will allow you to progress, but I really wouldn't call it a Metroidvania. Metroidvania adjacent? Sure. Action RPG adjacent? Sure. The game is a side-scrolling action platformer with some light RPG aesthetics. You run from left to right, you jump around, climb ladders, descend ladders, there are platforms to navigate. It's very much akin to those 16-bit side-scrollers of the era, your Sonics, your Bubsies, your Marios. You dispatch enemies with the attack button, enemies drop gold or healing items, and you occasionally fight a boss. Like I said, really familiar stuff. As you proceed through the game, you will encounter item shops and weapon shops. Item shops will allow you to buy healing items and accessories, and weapon shops will allow you to buy new gear. As stated, you don't level up in Popful Mail, so in order to get stronger, you need to buy gear. There's five sets of gear for Mail, Tato, and Gaw. The later gear can be pricey, and gold is at a premium in this game. You can find gold bullion, which you can sell for a decent amount of money, but there is a plot point where you need to have four of these on hand to proceed, and if you've sold them all, then you're gonna get stuck for a little bit. Now, there are some enemies who will drop gold bullion, but if you don't know this and don't know where they are, you're really gonna be stuck for a little while. Gold is something else that working designs tainted with their version of the game. A number of items are made much more expensive. Most notably for me was the amulet. The amulet is a fun item that makes you completely invincible for about a minute or so. The downside is that you can't attack enemies. This is fine though because the amulet makes traversal a lot easier. 
If you are lost or you're trying to get somewhere fast or you don't want the hassle of fighting dudes, just chuck on an amulet and run through the enemies. Cool stuff and it only costs 100 gold. But Working Designs decided that this wasn't cool, so they jacked the price all the way up to 1000 gold. Thanks guys! Some weapons will have a little magic meter attached to prevent from spamming distance attacks. If you run out of meter, you will need to wait for it to start recharging again to do the attack. This is kind of like the mana games, but you don't have to wait for the meter to completely refill before regaining these attacks, so that's kind of cool. You can also press down to block. Nice. Mill, Tato, and Gaw all only really kind of slightly play differently from each other. Mill starts off with a melee sword attack, Tato starts off with a little magic fireball, and Gaw starts off with a little fireball breath attack. Very quickly, Mill starts getting weapons that give her distance attacks though. Mill runs a little bit faster than Tato and Gaw, and Gaw jumps a little bit higher than Mill and Tato, and that's really it to be honest. Mill being faster and Gaw jumping a little bit higher doesn't really contribute to any sort of progression based gameplay. The three all have different health bars though, so swapping out during boss fights to stay alive is definitely a valid strategy. Boss fights are a highlight as Falcom have always been great at making memorable boss fights. Bosses are big explosive unique fights with their own mechanics on how to defeat them. Being Falcom, you can also expect them to be pretty difficult as well. And as I keep saying, this isn't an RPG so you can't grind out a few levels to get stronger. You need to beat them with skill and a load of healing items. Popful Mail has a host of healing items like oranges, cherries, bananas, apples, and melons, all of which heal a decent amount of HP compared to how much they cost. You can even get elixirs which will auto revive you when you die. I'd suggest entering every boss with as many of these as you can as they can definitely get spicy. Some bosses have projectiles that can hit you from several screens away, some have weak spots that need very precise shots to hit, and some bosses have multiple forms. These things are tough, but real fun. The box for Pop for Mail boasts over 2.5 hours of spoken dialogue, and the game really does offer this. Keep in mind this was the early 90s before CD based games really took off, so real speech in games was a pretty big deal. I think that this is part of the reason that the game is erroneously labeled as an action RPG. There is a lot of dialogue like an RPG. As stated earlier, your mileage may vary with this fact as working designs are notorious for adding dumb jokes and dated references to their translations. Maybe most egregious this time around is giving the villain Sven T. Uncommon a really bad Arnold Schwarzenegger impression. All of his dialogue is like this, it's truly dreadful. But as an 11 year old I probably would have loved this. Adding to the loads of dialogue is something that actually adds some replayability. Whenever there is a dialogue scene, the dialogue will actually change depending on who you are controlling at the time. If Mail is in the lead, you will get voice dialogue from her. If Ga or Tato is in the lead, you will get dialogue from them instead. If you want to hear all of the game's dialogue, you will have to play the game a couple of times. As mentioned earlier, Falcom had big plans for Popful Mail. After the initial game's release, there were plans for a full on media franchise. A brief animation was produced as a means to shop around the idea for an anime. But after searching for a publisher, they were unable to find anyone interested and the idea was scrapped. But if you're interested in seeing more, the animation test is actually available to watch right here on YouTube. I love old school fantasy anime like Lotus War and Slayer, so I think this looks really cool. Enter Sega. Sega and Falcom had a good relationship in the early days and wanting to leverage this friendship, Sega approached Falcom with a proposal to port the game to the brand new Sega CD as a spin-off to Sonic the Hedgehog. Yes, I am being serious. No, this is not a joke, this is the bizarre reality that we live in. The title would have been retooled into what would have been titled Sister Sonic. Yes, Mail would have ended up being Sonic's sister. 
I don't know if this would have been her in her elf form or if she would have been reskinned as a hedgehog. We just don't know. Eventually, Sega reneged on this idea and canceled the project. This is when Working Design swooped in to claim the leftovers for themselves. They localized the game for the West as Popful Mail and Sister Sonic was never heard of again. That was the first and last time they ever tried to expand the Sonic universe with new characters. Yep, they never tried that ever again. Quite a few years later, the game was ported to mobile phones and Windows, just in Japan, of course. The only version the West ever got was the, once again, tainted working designs port. And this is 100% a double-edged sword. As I always say, working designs are kinda bad. Their translations are loaded down with bad jokes and, what was back then, modern day references. And it's not that modern day anymore. Jokes about Bill Clinton, Bob Vila, and Barney the Dinosaur are potentially entirely lost on modern gamers. Plus added jokes about good head, felching, and tossing the salad just totally rip you out of the moment. I get the argument that sometimes a localizer needs to kind of replace a very Japanese reference with something more familiar to an English speaker, but this is 10,000% overkill. Working designs are also notorious for ruining the balance of games. Like I said, they made amulets in this game cost 10 times what they normally cost. They had a penchant for increasing difficulty of enemies, making gear more expensive, and altering how save games work all for the sake of making games less likely to be returned from kids beating them too fast. This isn't cool, this is kinda lame actually. These niche games on niche systems weren't going to sell millions of copies. The people who bought these games were going to buy them regardless. But in the same breath, I have to thank Working Designs for localizing the games that they did. Localization decisions aside, game balance tweaks aside, this company brought us a lot of great games. Lunar, Lunar 2, Elundra, Dragon Force, Magic Knight Ray Earth, Vanguard Bandits. These are all great games that we are better off for having available to us back in the day. If Working Designs didn't translate them, these would be games that would be potentially lost to time. Potentially someone could have done a fan translation, but I think getting them back when we did was important. Working Designs brought us some killer titles. These titles may have been tainted by bad localizations and screwy balance changes, but I know that I'm a lot happier having played these games in my youth. Now, if you don't have any nostalgia for Working Designs, let me tell you about a great patch that reverts several of the game edits back to their original Japanese settings. There is this great project called Unworked Designs. This guy has a series of patches for a number of Working Designs titles that reverts game changes back to the original Japanese games. Difficulty is back to normal, stats are back to normal, gear costs are back to normal. I highly recommend you check out stargood.org slash unworked if you want to play some of these games. The patch made Popful Mail much more enjoyable. I only wish I had it when I replayed Vi a few months back. Just keep in mind this doesn't alter Working Design's crappy localizations. These patches are strictly gameplay revisions only. Also, I have nowhere else to put this, but here's a picture of a Popful Male skin for Tina in Dead or Alive 5, which I literally cannot believe is actually a thing that exists. Despite several entities' attempts to elevate Popful Mail to something greater, the game has been relegated to the dusty confines of nearly forgotten history. The plans for an anime, a Sonic the Hedgehog adaptation, or any sequels have long been abandoned. Popful Mail will go down in video gaming history as a minor blip, a barely audible beep, a slight bloop. Many action side-scrollers have come and gone in a similar fashion, just another platformer in a long list of platformers. But what could have been? Who knows what Falcom would look like today if they had actually been responsible for the first Sonic spin-off? Would they have been absorbed by Sega? Would they sit alongside Ken Penders? Would they still be doing Ease titles? Who even knows? But Falcom is better than ever. Ease and the Trails games are great, and I am so glad we have them. But there's this 
little nagging feeling in the back of my heart wishing that Popful Mail went on to greater things. Hey guys, thanks for watching. I hope you enjoyed the video. It was great to finally sit down and play this game all the way through for the first time ever. This was one game I really, really wanted as a kid, and I feel a little bit more complete now that I've played it. Now, this is the part where I say all the stuff. Please like, share, subscribe, ring the bell, join a cult, write to your pen pal, update your resume, drink a glass of milk, get your bones nice and strong, realize your skeleton would love to be free, also realize your skeleton is wearing your skin and organs like a tailored suit, realize that skeletons are totally sweet. I've been Richard for RPG Fortress, see you next time, and don't forget to hug a cat. Goodbye.